Hello, my name is Ice Taylor, and welcome to my complete beginner's guide to submarines in Azure Lane. In this video, I'll be going over all the basics you need to know about subs and sub related content. And since this will be a lengthy video, what I've done is I've set up a table of contents that you can use to skip ahead to whatever part is relevant to you. Uh, but if you're completely new to subs, and subs have recently caught your fancy for reasons, uh, then I would recommend watching the video from start to finish. Alright, so here's the table of contents as well as the topics I'm going to cover. So I'm going to have some timestamps in the description that you can use to jump ahead to whatever topic you want. So let's start with a quick introduction to submarines. So first off, what are submarines? Well, they're essentially just a special type of ship. Uh, they're unlocked after clearing 3-4, aka the Fox Mines, at which point the game gives you a quick introduction to subs, it gives you I-58 for free, and a grey depth charger and a grey sonar. Uh, subs are deployed through their own special fleet, separate from the main fleet, shown here. And to get more subs outside of events, the only way is to build in the special pool. So a common question I get asked are, is subs worth it? Or are they good? Uh, so the answer to that is basically, it's complicated. Uh, subs are basically not impactful at all in early, mid-game, and even in the start of late game. Uh, subs really only prove themselves useful in the very late game, so currently like Chapter 12 and Chapter 13, where that extra damage they can provide can actually make or break a sortie. Uh, but that being said, subs are not necessary to clear Chapter 12 and 13, and I know of many people who just completely disregard them and got through Chapter 13 just fine without them. So with all this in mind, subs are basically a luxury. If you put the time and the resources into them to level and gear them, they can do some good damage and make your endgame life much easier. On the other hand, you may feel that they aren't worth the effort, and be okay with facing endgame without them. At the end of the day, it's really up to you to decide if they're worth it or not. Okay, so to start off with the submarine battle mechanics section, we'll talk about subs when on the map view, so like this view here. So we can see my subs spawned in right here. Uh, maps that allow subs will actually have a couple of set spawn locations, so it's not completely random where they spawn in. Uh, we can see my fleet has six ammo. Uh, usually each sub fleet will have two ammo per sub, so because I have three subs in my fleet, that's six ammo. All right, and so when we click this uh, little like clipboard looking button here, we'll have three sub buttons here. So this first one here, it simply toggles your, your uh, sub fleet between support mode and attack mode, which we'll go over in a minute. We have this button here, which allows you to reposition your sub. So when you click a new location for your sub fleet to go to, it'll show you a preview of your new sub's hunting range. And if you actually click the reposition button, it'll tell you how much oil it costs for you to move to your new location, because this is not it's not free. And uh, we're going to cancel that. Uh, this last button here, it simply turns on and off these red cross things on the, uh, on the tiles, which signifies your sub's hunting range. Uh, so what is the sub's hunting range? Excellent question. So the hunting range is shown, like I said, by these marked tiles with the little red X's. And enemy, any enemies within these marked tiles are attackable by your subs. So when your sub is in attack, or sorry, when it, your sub is in support mode, uh, your sub will not move. They'll remain underwater, and they will not attack nearby enemy fleets. Uh, at this point, their sole purpose is just to be called in during an engagement with an enemy fleet. However, when they're in attack mode. Your sub will move up to two tiles per turn, so if I were to move here, she'll actually attack this one fleet here. And on contact, like there, they'll deal up to 20% of an enemy's health in damage. So that one was like 19.58 or something. Uh, let's pretend that was 20%. So if it was 20%, if we were to engage this enemy here, this one with this debuff, um, all enemies will spawn in at 80% health. And so there's a few things to note about this though is one, this can't be done to bosses. It just doesn't work, it doesn't allow you to do that. Number two, this will consume ammo of the uh, of the subfleet. Three, this doesn't cost oil to attack enemy fleets. Four, this doesn't gain XP for, for your subs. Number five, an enemy can't be attacked twice by your subs. Once it has this debuff to signify it's been attacked, you can't just like do it again. Just don't, It's either it has a debuff or it doesn't. Uh, number six, when your sub moves around the hunting range, uh, your, the hunting range doesn't move with your sub. So my sub spawned in here and moved one square over. The hunting range didn't move with her. If you want to move to hunting range, you have to do it manually through this uh, this screen here, as we showed before. And lastly, when your sub runs out of ammo, they actually just they just leave the battle. Like there is no zero ammo uh, sub battle. They're, they're just gone. And that is pretty much all you need to know about subs when on the map view. 
So for this next part of the section, we're going to be talking about submarine battle mechanics when you're actually fighting an enemy. So this includes bosses. If you're within the submarine's hunting range, marked by these red X's here, in battle, you're going to get a little button at the bottom right, a little submarine button. So that allows you to call in your subs at any point of the battle once at the cost of oil and one ammo. So this is where subs cost oil, Jared. Uh, so subs take about three seconds to actually start firing. They'll start off by firing their special barrages as well as their regular torpedoes. And this does really good burst damage. And it's especially potent in short battles like against sirens. So if you're fighting a mob, if you're going to uh, launch the subs, I'd recommend just, just launch them right away. However, against bosses, you can do one of two things. You can either launch them right away in order to save other cooldowns like, uh, like salvos and get to the boss faster. Or you can save them until the boss actually spawns in order to maximize the damage you deal to the boss. And here we can see a U81 grabbing MVP. So after your subs launch their barrages, they will stick around underwater for a bit and fire their torpedoes off normally. And while underwater, they're actually untargetable, but the time they can remain underwater depends on their oxygen stat, and it's also shown by the blue bar underneath their health. Um, they can stay underwater for roughly 1 second per 10 oxygen, and after that oxygen runs out, then they'll surface, continue firing their, their torpedoes off normally as well as their auxiliary gun, and then shortly after they'll retreat off the side of the map. Alright, so, leveling submarines. First off, let's make this clear. It's gonna be slow. Very slow. So don't expect to have a 120 sub for a long time. So subs can get XP from a variety of places. The first just being regular sorties, when you call them into battle. Uh, this doesn't include when they attack enemy nodes on the map view though. So subs can get XP also from commissions, just like any other ship. Uh, from being in the first floor of the dorm from the lecture hall. Uh, the game classifies them as destroyers, so the lecture hall can be used on Mondays and Fridays. And finally, you can get XP from the weekly supply line disruption stage. So subs don't get XP from exercises, nope. daily stages, nope. story hard nope. modes, nope. and nope. some nope. event nope. stages nope. and nope. normal nope. stages, nope. simply nope. because nope. you just nope. you can't bring nope. the subs nope. along to those stages. So how would I recommend you level your subs? Well, aside from using them in combat when you really need them, I would recommend just putting them in your dorm and using them in 10 hour commissions when you have oil available. And then eventually they'll hit 120. So, which subs are good? Well, we can safely start by saying that rarity does matter in this case. SSR subs are just better than elite subs in most cases. In terms of the best SSR sub, that's really going to depend on their skills, like their barrages, their buffs, and their synergy with other subs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go over a basic uh, tier list and explain the reasoning behind it. Uh, but it's important to note that the difference between the best and the worst SSR sub is pretty minimal. So you're safe to really just pick whatever SSR sub you feel like, and you won't notice that big of a difference. So we're going to start off our basic tier list with the SSR KMS subs at tier 0. So these subs are widely accepted to be the best subs because of their fleet synergy, gaining buffs for every other KMS sub in the fleet. Uh, next at tier 0.5, I've put Minato Aqua. Uh, I put her here because although she doesn't have the synergy that the KMS subs bring, she does have a really powerful focused frontal barrage that's really effective against like bosses or big targets. So at tier 1, I have just the rest of the SSR subs. So they are a little bit worse than the Aqua and the KMS subs, but they're still great subs, and I would highly recommend leveling them if you have them. So at tier 2 and 3, I've kind of bunched together just the rest of the elite subs. Uh, the reasoning behind this is that besides maybe one or two exceptions, it's really not worth leveling an elite sub because of the commitment and time it takes to level it. So you're better off waiting until you have uh, an SSR sub and putting your resources into that one instead. So I would like to give one shout out to an elite sub, and that's U522. So what makes U522 special? is this skill here, Open Ocean Support. So what this allows you to do is to call in your subs once per sortie in battle, even if the enemy you're facing is not within your sub's hunting range. So this can be really useful, uh, say if you wanted to use your subs on the boss only, and the boss didn't spawn within your sub's hunting range. So this allows you to save some oil by not having to move your subs within range of, uh, of the boss. Uh, it is important to note though that if you do call in your subs into battle, 
against an enemy that is within your sub's hunting range, it won't consume this one free pass that lets you use it outside the range. Submarine Gear So, submarines use torpedoes as their primary weapon, but these are special torpedoes that only subs can use, not the same ones that regular ships use. So let's quickly go over which torpedoes are best to use. So to start off, we'll just say that all gold torpedoes are better than purple. And next, we'll just quickly go over each individual gold torpedo that's available right now. So to start off, we have the Mark 16, which has high damage and a high reload time. Next, we have the Type 95 torpedo, which has decent damage as well as a decent reload time. Lastly, we have the G70 Acoustic Guided Torpedo. So this torpedo has better reload time than the Type 95, but also slightly lower damage. What makes this torpedo unique is, like the name suggests, it homes in on its enemies. So because of this, the G70, or the Magtorp as I like to call it, has the most consistent damage out of all the torpedoes, and is the best torpedo you can get. The next best being the Type 95, followed by the Mark 16. It is important to note though that the difference in damage between all of these gold torpedoes isn't going to be that noticeable, but if you're going to go for the best, you may as well go for the G70. So for purple torpedoes, you can pretty much use any purple torpedo you feel like, because the DPS is relatively the same. Uh, the only exceptions to that is the Mark 14, shown here, as well as the 550mm, shown here, one that I've actually just made for this video. Um, the reason behind these two is that their DPS is far lower than other torpedoes, so you want to avoid these. For your secondary gun slot, uh, besides I-13 using a seaplane and Surkuf using a, uh, her special CA gun, uh, you're going to be equipping your sub with the best DD gun you have available. So this doesn't really matter that much though, as your sub only uses this gun very briefly after servicing and then retreating. Uh, so the bulk of your damage is going to come from your torpedoes. So I would definitely prioritize putting your best DD guns on your ships first, and then if you have extra, then throw them on your subs. Okay, next up we have auxiliary slots. So for this part, I'm going to be going over just the main gear you're going to be using. So I'll be skipping over some of the uh, less impactful auxiliary gear. Uh, so the primary two auxiliary equipment you're going to be using would be the Improved Snorkel and the Type 93 Pure Oxygen Torpedo. Uh, both these can be bought in the core shop, which refreshes once a month, or the stock refreshes. Uh, so what do these do? Well, the, uh, the Oxygen Torpedo is nice and simple. It just straight up increases your Torp stat and makes your Torps hit harder. Uh, ideally, you want to have at least one of these for each of your subs. Next is the Improved Snorkel. So what this does is it improves your or increases your sub's auction stat, allowing it to stay underwater for longer and fire off more torpedoes. Uh, I recommend this on most subs, but some subs can get away without needing it because they either have a skill that increases their auction, like U522, or they just have naturally high auction, like Minato Aqua or most USS subs. So I would like to mention a few more auxiliary gears, the first being the repair tools. Uh, so this is really useful if you're using subs early on and they're just getting absolutely deleted, uh, this extra health can really help out. And lastly, I'd like to mention the Pearl Steers. So this is really useful as some people just use their subs as cannon fodder, specifically to be called in, die, and then heal up the rest of the fleet. Hooray! Acquiring gear. So let's start off with mentioning the starter box. Uh, so it's in the metal shop right here for 20 merits and can be bought twice a day. Uh, it gives you pretty garbage gray and blue gear only, and you can't combine this like other tech boxes into a purple box. So I would really not recommend buying this unless you really want to use your subs early game. So your primary source of getting sub gear and anti-submarine warfare gear is going to be from SOS missions, which we'll go over in more detail in the next section. Uh, another great, great way to get gear would be, if you're lucky, during events. Sometimes event stages will have uh, torpedoes or anti-submarine warfare gear on the drop table. And I would definitely recommend taking advantage of this if you don't have very good gear already. Uh, this is by far the fastest method of getting gear, as SOS missions give gear exceptionally slow. Okay, now that we've talked about submarine gear, let's discuss anti-submarine warfare gear. We'll begin with briefly explaining anti-submarine warfare in Azure Lane. So when you first encounter an enemy sub, they start off underwater and aren't attackable until you reveal its location. To reveal a sub, you'll need to use either a sonar or have a ship with a skill that can reveal enemy subs. After the sub is revealed, they become attackable for a short period of time, but only with anti-submarine weapons, which are depth charges and special anti-sub planes. Uh, after a little bit, the sub goes back into stealth mode and the process repeats itself. I would like to mention though that you don't have to actually care about anti-submarine warfare, because enemy subs are only present in SOS missions and some event stages. But even then, anti-submarine warfare isn't required to clear these stages. 
So without a sonar to reveal the enemy subs, enemy subs aren't attackable while they're underwater. But they will eventually surface after usually about 2 minutes, uh, sometimes less in event stages, at which point they're attackable by anything, not just anti-sub weapons. Uh, the only downside to this is that you could potentially die before the sub surfaces, and if the sub takes 2 minutes to surface, you give up your S rank clear because they've taken longer than 120 seconds, making you unable to increase your uh, SOS signal strength. One thing to note is that the only time you need to kill the enemy sub is when you're up against either a siren sub or the boss is a sub, like during SOS missions. If there's just random subs appearing during mob clears, like also during SOS missions, you don't actually have to kill those. You can just ignore them and you'll still be able to clear the node. So for acquiring anti-submarine warfare gear, it's actually done exactly the same way as acquiring sub gear, uh, which would be the daily boxes, SOS missions, the weekly raid, and finally in some event stages, if you're lucky. For my recommended anti-submarine warfare fleet and gear, what I'm going to do is just show my fleet and then explain my reasoning behind it. So my fleet consists of two destroyers, uh, one or both, which is equipped with a sonar, uh, and both of them are equipped with a depth charge. The backliner I find doesn't really matter, so I just have a random ship picked, in this case Bunker Hill. So I use destroyers because they have the highest anti-submarine warfare stat. Uh, I prefer to use a sonar over ship skills because I find the sonar gets the uh, enemy sub revealed uh, faster and more consistently. Uh, I like to use depth charges over anti-sub planes because the depth charger has highest DPS. Um, especially with two ships equipped with a depth charger, you can pretty much make quick work of any sub. Uh, finally for the backliner, I find that with two depth charge ships, you can use whatever backliner you want. It won't make any real difference, as your vanguard is going to kill a sub pretty easily by themselves. Uh, in terms of best in slot anti-sub gear, you're basically just going to use the highest rarity sonar and depth charge you have. Uh, the sonars go up to the gold rarity as seen here, and the depth charges only go up to purple. So this is actually like best in slot already. Okay, so this SOS missions part is going to be pretty long, but we'll start off by going over this SOS signals window here. And we'll go over how this works, we'll go over how best to utilize your distress signals, and then finally we'll go over the SOS stages themselves and the mechanics behind them. So let's start off with going over this window right here. So in the top left we have our signal strength. This is pretty much the indicator of how progressed into SOS missions you are. You start off with a signal strength of 1, and you can increase this up to 8, unlocking a few things along the way. So with each increase in signal strength, this will unlock the ability to store one more distress signal charge as shown down here. This is the number of times we're able to search for SOS missions using this search signal button, and these have a chance to recharge every 30 minutes, but it's guaranteed to get if you don't get one after 8 hours. Uh, with each increase in signal strength, you also increase the signal range, shown up here in the top right. Uh, this is the highest chapter SOS mission that you can get from your distress signals. These start with chapter 3 and go up to chapter 10. The last noteworthy unlocks are at uh, Signal Strength 6 and Signal Strength 8. At Signal Strength 6, you unlock the ability to receive purple gear drops from all SOS missions. And at Signal Strength 8, you unlock the ability to receive gold drops from all SOS missions. And finally, right here in the middle, these are just your active SOS missions. These last for 12 hours, and then they just expire when the timer runs out. So what's the fastest way to level your Signal Strength? Well, to do that, you have to properly utilize your Distress Signals. But before we go over that, we have to know that when you have an active SOS mission for a certain chapter, you cannot get a duplicate for that chapter when using another distress signal. So with that in mind, what you want to do is you want to bank up as many distress signals as you can, and then use them until you get the highest SOS mission possible for your current signal strength. You want to then clear that with an S rank to unlock the next stage, and then you want to continue searching until you can fish for the next highest level SOS mission available. If you don't get that one, you want to just leave it there, because now it's not in the pool of available chapters you can receive when using your signal. So when you're in an SOS sortie, the stage is very similar to the chapter's fourth stage. In fact, the drop ships are exactly the same. Uh, the main differences between an SOS sortie and a normal stage sortie would be that the enemy mob fleets will have subs in them, but they don't have to be killed. You can just ignore these completely. In fact, I'd recommend ignoring these and only putting anti-submarine gear on your boss fleet. Uh, for this chapter, the boss will always be a submarine, and that one has to be killed in order to complete the stage. Uh, there's no ambushes in this. Uh, there's no also no airstrikes, but the trade-off to that is that there's no clearing mode or danger level. In fact, there's actually not even a three-star objective that you can complete. 
So other than those differences, you can just clear the stage like any other stage and pray that you get good sub gear to drop. So for this last part of the video, we'll be talking about the weekly supply line disruption stage, which can oddly enough be found in the daily section. Uh, here it is. So this one can only be cleared twice per week, and it doesn't reset on Sundays like the other daily stages. So before we get into the stage itself, I just want to go over some of the UI elements that you'll find once we actually start the stage. So the first thing is going to be this little blue bar underneath your, health, your sub's health. So this is the auction stat. So this is going to slowly decrease for your currently active sub, and if it reaches zero, then they're going to be forced to surface, which is bad news. You don't want to do that. So in order to regenerate that auction, you want to switch them out with one of your subs on the bench. And while they're on the bench, they can regenerate their oxygen. Uh, next, we're going to look at these four buttons at the bottom right. So the one to the far left is the barrage button. So this one just unleashes a powerful barrage, which is going to be different depending on which sub you're using. This can only be used once per sub per stage. Uh, to the right of that, there's the switch out button. So this one will rotate which sub is currently active and it'll just rotate them around which one's on the bench and which one's active. You want to take advantage of this in order to make sure that your sub doesn't run out of oxygen. So when it gets low, you want to switch it out for a sub that will have full oxygen because they regenerated it while being on the bench. Uh, to the right of that is just the torpedo button. This just fires off a torpedo, it's nothing really special. Uh, you have a limited amount though, so don't waste them. And to the right of that is the, it's pretty much like the surface and the dive button. I don't think it has, really has like a name. Uh, but pretty much, if your sub is surfaced, then it'll dive down underwater, and if it's underwater already, then it'll surface. Alright, so this is the supply line disruption stage. So in order to maximize your rewards on here, you want to get an S rank. And in order to do that, you need to get 120 points. So you get 100 points from killing the boss, and you get 10 points each for killing cargo ships. So you need to kill two cargo ships to get 120 points. And also do this while not dying, because dying for each sub lost, you lose 15 points. Uh, you'll notice this is a side-scrolling map. So you can't just zoom ahead forward, you're going to need to wait until the map slowly scrolls forward. It's a little bit annoying. Um, you have some mines on the map here. So the ones that you need to worry about are the ones underwater, because the ones above water can't actually hurt you while you're underwater. The ones underwater can if you get close enough, like that. Uh, so for getting your two cargo ship kills, I recommend killing these two right here. Uh, you probably won't be able to one-shot them, but if you can, then hey, that, that works out. Uh, while doing this, you want to make sure you're watching your auction level, the little blue bar here. So you want to switch out your ship before it reaches zero, and let them regen regenerate that auction while they're on the bench. Um, if you're following my path, for this ship specifically here, what I do is I wait in the back and let the map kind of progress forward so that I can rush past him so he doesn't catch me. Uh, if, this, if this bar fills up, then these ships are notified of my location and they start depth charging me, which is kind of annoying. Um, for this part here, you want to do something similar to that last ship and wait in the back while while watching your oxygen. You can slip in between these two mines and you can also just ignore these ones here because we're underwater and these ones can't hit us. So for the boss, what you want to do is keep moving left and right and also line up yourself with the with the enemy or with the boss and fire off your barrages and your torpedoes. Once your torpedoes is are done, well actually mostly when your barrages is done, then you can switch ships and then start barraging with the next one and launch your torpedoes. So if you made it this far into the video, I just want to say a big thank you to you for sticking around. And if this video did help you, then be sure to leave a like and maybe hit that subscribe button, share with your friends who need some information on submarines. Um, this is actually my very first video guide I've made. It's my first time editing videos, actually. And it was a lot more difficult and time consuming than I thought, but it was fun. It was definitely worth it. Uh, and I also like to quickly shout out to myself. Uh, I do stream on Twitch. My uh, Twitch link is going to be in the description. And I'm also going to be leaving my, a link to my Discord. Uh, if you want to talk about Azure Lane, if you have any other further questions, if you want to know when I go live on Twitch, then uh, feel free to join the Discord. We have a pretty small but growing community, and uh, we'd be happy to have you.